Hi everybody, welcome to Peninsula 29. Thank you so much for joining us. We have some great talks for you. We hope you can see you in person soon, although we won't open until it's safe. Until then, get vaccinated if you can and follow all the relevant uh, guidance and regulations from the government. Um, we do hope that you can join us on Discord. There should be a link right below this video. Um, if you haven't joined us on Discord yet to talk about the talks and to ask questions, uh, we love to engage with the uh, speakers and with each other. And until then, sit back, enjoy the talks, and I'll see you towards the end of the meetup. Hello, folks. My name is Nelson Alhaj, and today I will be presenting my talk entitled Thinking Outside the Element in which I'll be presenting a hopefully new perspective to you on how to think about array indices and array indexing, both in Python, but also in beyond, also beyond in other programming languages and environments you may work in. Start with a quick intro, who am I? Um, my name's Nelson, like I said, that's my Twitter handle. It's also my name on most of the internet. I'm a software engineer. I've worked on a bunch of stuff. Most recently, I was at Stripe building infrastructure and developer tooling. Prior to that, I worked at a company called Casebleis doing uh, hot reboots, hot patching for the Linux kernel. Uh, so I've moved around the stack and worked all the way from the kernel up to application development and development tools. And I think both of those perspectives actually will bear a bit on what I have to say today. I've also done some work on some open source tools. You may have encountered Repeater, which is a tool I built that lets you move programs between terminals on uh, Linux machines. All right, so what are we talking about today? I'm gonna to be talking about array indexing. I'll be using this prototypical list, a list of the first 10 characters of the English alphabet as my example. So in Python, which we'll be using for all of our examples here, this is a Python conference, um, we often can avoid thinking about list indices by using list comprehensions, iterators, other such nice technologies. But we can't always avoid it. Sometimes it ends up being very, comp very necessary or even helpful to think about arrays explicitly in terms of indices. And I'm hopeful that the perspective I give you today will come in handy if and when you do. All right. So what I want to talk about today is what might seem like a, either a basic or a philosophical question of what are indices? When we are using indexes, indices into an array, what are we doing? The common picture that probably you've seen some version of this diagram before, if you've been programming for long, is that to think of indices as naming positions of L, of in the array, of naming elements in the array. Uh, you know, the first element here, which happens to have the value A, we refer to as element zero, and its index is just a name for it. It's a way to refer to it. What I want to talk about today in large part is I want to present an alternate picture of how to think about this array, and I want to persuade you that it's, if not the uniquely correct way to think about arrays, it's at least useful and powerful and helpful for honing your intuition in thinking about arrays. Uh, in particular, I want to argue that you're often better off thinking of array indices as names for the positions between elements. That rather than saying that element A is index 0, so index 0 actually points sort of just to the left of element A there, at the very start of the array. And index 1 points between A and B and all the way off there to index 10 on the right, which points to the right end, rightmost end of the array. Now, in order to make this work, we do have to start by taking what seems like a bit of a step backwards, and we're going to have to change what we mean by indexing by a single index, looking up a single element. We define element, looking up element i of a as the element to the right of that index. That restores the definitions that we're used to. Taking a subscript 0 still gives us back uh, taking big A or the array subscript zero still gives us back that first letter A, um, but we've had to sort of shift a little bit. So right now this picture seems a little bit more confusing than when we started with. So um, by the end of the talk, hopefully you will agree that this is a that despite that little hiccup, this is a valuable and productive way to think about array indexes and array indexing. Uh, but first, we're going to do a brief review of Python indexing in general, starting with concepts that you're almost certainly familiar with, moving a little bit further afield, and exploring a little bit of the rationale for why some things work the way they do. And then we'll get back to this picture. So 
we have our prototypical exam our example array. We can look up elements by index. Indexing in Python, it, array indexing in Python is zero based. So the kind of the first element of the array is at index zero. You can look up random other elements. That f is at index five. We spell that x square brackets five. Uh, in Python, we can also index from the back of the list using negative indices. So x subscript minus one gets us the last element of the array there. That's also equal to x of len of x minus one. So we can always think of negative indices as subtracting off from the length of the ray instead of subtracting off from zero as, as they sort of appear that they do. Um, that duality can be useful to keep in mind sometimes of negative arrays, sort of, you can imagine a virtual length of the array term sitting there right in front of that minus sign. Uh, in Python, we can also index uh, slices of the arrays. We can use the colon form of array indexing to get out a range of elements. In this case, those three elements would be selected by x of 2 colon 5. Now this gets to the first per little bit non-obvious thing, if you start to think through this, uh, of array indexing, which is that these slice indices are what we call half open. If we look at x of 2 colon 5 on that first element there, we look at x of 2 and we look at x of 5, the array, the subarray of 2 colon 5 includes x of 2 down at the bottom there, and it excludes x subscript 5. So it includes the left index, but it excludes the right index. In math and in CS theory, we call that half open, sometimes half open. Um, I actually forget if we call this half open on the left or the right, but it's closed on the left and open on the right. Uh, so why do slices work like that in Python? Why is this the convention that we've settled on? Why doesn't the slice, for instance, include both endpoints or neither or include the right but not the left? So the first observation of, of why these half open slices work out nicely is that they make this length arithmetic sort of work out the way that you'd like. Uh, the length of that subslice we can find just by taking the right index and subtracting off the left index. In both cases, it's three here. So these slices uh, save you having to do a plus one or a minus one when you're reasoning about the length of subarrays, which is just nice. It, it makes things simpler, it makes expressions simpler, it makes it easier to avoid some off by one errors. So We'd get that result if we included either endpoint, but if we included either the left endpoint or the right endpoint, just so long as we include exactly one of them. Another nice property of having half open slices is that adjacent slices share an index. We can see 2 colon 5 on the left there in blue and 5 colon 7 on the right there in yellow. And they both have 5 in the middle. So if we're dividing an array, we're partitioning it in some way perhaps. Uh, the, the slices that butt up against each other will share an index, which is just sort of, it's, again, it's aesthetically nice, it's, it's, I mean, you could call it elegant, but more practically speaking, it tends to make things easier to write. It avoids plus ones and minus ones, it avoids, makes it a little easier to avoid those off by one errors. Um, and then lastly, we'll point out that we'd have both of those previous properties as long as we included one endpoint and not the other. But for the sake of the special case of slices that start at the beginning of the array, we really want to include the left endpoint because that lets us write this slice as 0, 3. If we included the right endpoint but not the left, we have to write this as negative 1, 2. And that negative 1, again, would be just messy and confusing. So for these reasons, the convention that Python has settled on, which is a relatively common convention in, in many languages, is that slices include their left index, but not their right index. Uh, this is all building a bit to my next point, which is I want to revisit this picture now. Of, of We're now armed with some of the preparatory material to argue that we should think of array indices as pointing between elements, like I've drawn in this picture. And there's a number of reasons, but ultimately, arguably, the biggest one is that it makes ranges or slices kind of just work out naturally. Everything I just explained falls directly out of that picture. If we look here at x of 2 colon 5, if we look at the, the sort of naive conception up top of naming elements, 
we can see that we have that kind of special case I mentioned. It includes two, it doesn't include five, what's up with that? But if we've shifted by half an element, we look at the bottom perspective where we're naming the gaps between elements, there's only one thing that x2 colon 5 could possibly mean in that picture. It's exactly the set of elements that are contained between 2 and 5. So by shifting this convention here to this convention, we've made slices with all of the nice properties that I previously explained just fall naturally out of the formalism, out of the model, no edge cases, no special cases. They're just they're much more natural. Um, Similarly, if we look at the case of slices that end, that, that go all the way to the right end of the array, this is particularly natural because the, normally we have to include this len of array term on the right-hand side there. Python would let us omit it, omit it entirely, but if we want to write both endpoints explicitly, we have to say 5 colon 10. But in our first picture, the one on top of the array there, 10 isn't even a valid index. So it's a little bit weird that we have to write it to express this slice. Our new picture makes it a bit less of a special case and makes it very clear why there are actually n plus 1 kind of valid or at least interesting indices in an array of length n. Uh, another big reason that I like thinking about indices as pointing between elements is for array insertion. Here, if we take this first array x, we insert the string epsilon at element 5, it's again immediately obvious what should happen. We're going we're gonna to put it at element 5 in between E and F, and we'll, we'll get the picture that we see below. If we look at the doc string for the insert method on Python lists, which implicitly uses the sort of old style convention of naming elements, we can see that it's documented to insert an object before the index. Because uh, Python conceives of indexes, indices as pointing at elements, there's this ambiguity in insert of should it go before or should it go after that index? That has to be resolved and that if you're kind of thinking about it, you're reading the doc string, you might you have to consider both possibilities and make sure that you've remembered correctly and that you're thinking about it correctly. If your indices point between elements, no ambiguity, everything just works. The last point I want to talk about is that conceiving of elements in this way makes some index arithmetic a bit simpler. So I want to pose a little bit of a question that might or might not bother some of you in the audience, but that I think is a bit interesting to think about. So the first element of an array we know is x subscript 0, and the last one is x subscript minus 1. So for some reason, when we're counting from the left, we start at 0. When we're counting from the right, though, we start at 1. Why isn't it, for by symmetry, why isn't it x of minus 0? Obviously, mechanically, we can't make it x of minus 0 because minus 0 isn't a thing, and that would be ambiguous. So there's sort of an obvious practical reason why, why you know, we might adopt this convention. But is there some deeper reason? Why, why is there this asymmetry here? That counting from the left starts from 0, counting from the right starts from 1. What's up with that? Well. If we actually draw out all of the indices using the notation that I prefer, where we draw them between elements, the asymmetry actually disappears here. And we can see that counting in both directions starts from 1 and goes all the way to 10 to the length of the array. Now, the reason for the slight asymmetry in notation is because we've decided to say that element indexing breaks to the right of the index. So in some sense, 0 and 1 are both arguably valid names for that element containing A, but we've decided that indexing breaks to the right, so we're going to use 0 as the name for it. Similarly, 0 and minus 1 are both defensible names for the last element of the array, but because we look to the right when we're indexing an element, we use negative 1 as the name, and we refer to that as x of minus 1. And the last reason for this perspective is that it comes in handy if we're doing some sort of stream processing or we're consuming an array incrementally and keeping track of a pointer of how far we've gone. So if we convert this array into a string I.O., into a file-like object that lets us read from it, and we read five characters off, then we can ask the string I.O. object to tell us where the file pointer is and tell us how far we are along in the element. We'll get out five. 
Now with this picture, it's very kind of intuitively obvious from that picture what that five means. That five is now pointing between the part of the underlying buffer that we have read and the part that we haven't yet read. It nicely divides them. If we were to say that that five was associated with an element, with the element f, the picture would be a little bit less clear. We'd have to define it as pointing as the first unprocessed element, which is just a little bit messier, a little bit more prone to error. So that's what I have for the talk today. I hope that you found this a useful perspective. Maybe think about it going forward. It, uh, I find it ultimately most useful to be able to flip between both perspectives a little bit at will and to think about your, your indices pointing either at elements or between elements, depending on the problem you're solving. But I definitely use this between element perspective as my default perspective if I'm reasoning through some tricky index arithmetic or otherwise. I've also included a link here to the blog post that this talk is a version of from a couple of years back. You can visit that for a bit more perspective and a couple of other applications in another domains. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'll uh, be around on Discord and otherwise on the internet.
for attending my talk. My name is Benji. I'm one of the core contributors to Pants, which is an open source build system. And today we're going to talk about Python codebase architecture and specifically about monorepos. So first, a little about me. I have uh, many years experience as a software engineer. I've had the good fortune to work at some great companies. I'm a maintainer of the Pants open source project, as I mentioned. And today I'm the co-founder of Toolchain, which is a startup in the build system space. And this is me before my COVID hair. So today we're going to talk uh, about three things. First, what is a monorepo? Then why would I want one? And finally, what kind of tooling you need to work effectively in a monorepo? So let's jump right in to what is a monorepo. A common characteristic of code bases, particularly organizational code bases that are um, worked on by a team, is that they grow over time. And they grow because each developer keeps adding code over time, but also your team itself may be growing over time. So you have more developers adding more code and your code base grows super linearly over time. And this leads to a challenge. A common consequence of code base growth is that builds get harder. They get slower and flakier and less manageable. Now, I can hear maybe some objections. You may be thinking Python is not a compiled language. So what do you mean by builds? So I mean builds in the general sense. All the steps that you take from when you hit save in your editor all the way to having a deployable artifact. So examples include resolving and downloading your external dependencies, generating code, uh, running the type checker, running tests is obviously a big one, debugging, linting, formatting, uh, packaging to build those deployable artifacts, whether they are wheels or PEX files or AWS lambdas. So even though Python is not compiled, there is still a build in a very real sense. And this build is challenged by the growth of your code base. So what can we do? As your organization and your code base grow, we have to choose how to manage that in a scalable way. And we have two architectural alternatives, multi-repo and monorepo. Let's start by talking about multi-repo. In the multi-repo architecture, you split your code base into growing numbers of small repos, typically along uh, sort of sub-team boundaries or project boundaries or library boundaries. And this often happens because it's the path of least resistance. The Python tooling nudges you in that direction in various ways. But there is an alternative. And the alternative is the monorepo. And a monorepo is a unified code base that contains code for multiple projects worked on by multiple teams that share underlying dependencies and functionality and processes and so on. A monorepo, for example, may contain code in multiple languages. It may contain code that uses multiple frameworks. So maybe you have Flask code and Django code in there, uh, or maybe you have code generators using protocol buffers and others that are using Thrift. You typically have different sub teams working on different parts of the monorepo, but very often their work overlaps because there are a lot of these shared dependencies. And as your organization grows, as your code base grows, your monorepo grows right along with them. Now, I should emphasize that monorepo is not the same as a monolithic server. We're talking about code base architecture here, not deployment architecture. So a monorepo code base is agnostic as to whether you deploy monoliths or microservices out of that code base. And in fact, I feel quite strongly that a monorepo is a preferable architecture for microservices because it makes it easier to manage all of those shared dependencies between those services without having to take some very heavyweight steps. And we'll see an example of this. So we've talked about what a monorepo is. Let's get into why you should want one. And I will admit, multi-repo sounds better at first if you just present these as I've described them. Multi-repo sounds more bottoms up, more locally managed, more decentralized. Those are good buzzwords, right? 
And multi-repo is also tempting to us because it allows us to put a barrier between, you know, my perfect repo and all those other barbarians. If you want to make changes, if you want to mess up with my beautiful code, you have to come through me. And that is really tempting. But there is a set of core code base management problems that multi-repo not only doesn't solve, but it hides them and it introduces new problems instead. Whereas mono repos make these issues explicit so that you can reason about them and have tooling that helps you handle that complexity instead of kicking it down the road and pretending it doesn't exist. And so let's look at this real world scenario the main example I want to look at is the problem of managing dependencies in the presence of changes. This to me is one of the hardest problems about managing a code base and particularly where those two things overlap. Managing dependencies is hard, but managing dependencies in the presence of changes is dramatically harder and vice versa. That intersection is where so much code base management pain lives. So let's look at how these kinds of challenges have to be handled in a multi-repo world. So multi-repo relies on publishing. For code in repo A to be consumed by code in repo B, repo A has to publish that code in an artifact like an SDIST or a wheel or whatever. And note that publishing in this case probably means to a private repository. I'm not necessarily talking about you know, public PyPy, because remember that we're talking about an organization's internal code base. But unless repo A never changes, and again, when does code never change, these artifacts need a versioning scheme. Right, so multi-repo relies on versioning. When you make a change in repo A, you have to republish under a new version. Why? Because otherwise the changes might break the existing consumers of repo A. So say repo B depends on repo A at a specific version. When repo A, repo B rather, needs to consume a change in repo A, you have to modify A, uh, publish it at a new version, and then consume that new version in a new version of B. Now, that's all assuming that the owner of B has the ability to make changes in A. If not, they have to find the owner of A and convince them to make those changes. I mean, technically, in my example, people these people all work in the same organization, but uh, you know they may not be <laughs> friends. Who knows? But even now, you're not done. You have two choices now. Um, when it comes to change management, the first choice you can make is the virtuous choice. This is if you want to be a good guy. Um, you find all the consumers of repo A. That includes your repo B, but uh, you know there may be many others you have to ensure that they still work with your change at your new version and maybe there are other changes bundled up in that version as well and you have to make changes as needed to all of those consumers of a until you're convinced that your change is good so maybe all the tests pass in all those other repos and that's a lot of work because for one thing how do you know who all the consumers of repo a are Right. Remember that the metadata about who consumes who lives on the consuming side. The repo A has no metadata about who is using it. And then you find all the consumers of repo A. How do you know how to verify that your changes are good? So do you know how to run the tests in the repo? Do you know kind of how to prove that it's in a good state? But let's say you figured all that out. Are you done? You're not because you've made changes in other repos, not just A. So now you have to do everything I just described recursively. You have to find all the consumers of every repo you changed and you have to make sure that they work and then you have to keep going until you hit the transitive closure. And this is a lot of work. So very often people don't make the virtuous choice, they make the lazy choice. And the lazy choice is don't even worry about the other consumers of repo A because you know they're safely pinned. This is what versioning is for. They're safely pinned to that earlier version of A. And I guess let them deal with the problems when they upgrade. But the problem with this is it's not very nice, right? You're supposed to all be on the same team, but by the time they need to upgrade, maybe because they need to consume other changes, you may have lost context for your change. They certainly won't have context for your change. You may not even be around to help anymore. You've essentially kicked the can down the road. And so what problem does this cause? 
This causes the famous dependency hell problem where because a binary or, or some repo C in this case may end up depending on different versions of A through different dependency parts, you have to pick one and it's possible that neither of them will actually work. And so you end up with this conflict that re actually requires all of that uh, hard work. And this is what I mean by hiding problems. Multi-repo allows you to implicitly push responsibilities off onto other people in the future. You're leaving little time bombs in the code base that will explode at some later time. That's not a good way to run a team. Whereas, how does this work in a mono repo? There's no versioning and there's no publishing. All the consumers of your code are right there in the same repo. So for example, the effects of your change are immediately visible. You can find all the consumers of your code using ripgrep or whatever you use to grok your code base. And you can run all the tests in the code base to ensure that your changes are valid. You can essentially advance the code base in lockstep. And so this is an example of where the code base architecture enforces responsibility and good teamwork. So monorepos can be preferable in many ways. We've just seen an extended example. But even though it's counterintuitive, we can see that monorepos are actually more flexible than the alternative. And before we move on, I want to leave you with the thought that your code base and its structure is a reflection of your organization. If you break up your code base, you can be fracturing your organization. And if you have a unified code base, your organization can unify around it. And this is why many large companies have adopted the monorepo architecture to keep their organizations unified, even at huge scale. And, and one of the biggest examples of this, is, as is well known, is Google. They have you know, probably the biggest code base th that is imaginable um, with tens, many tens of thousands of engineers all working on this same code base. But of course, they do it with tooling, and that's what we're going to talk about. So we want a more on a repo. Let's say we've agreed on that. How do we work in one effectively? And this is where Pants comes in. So. Standard Python tools, PyTest, MyPy, PyLint, Black, you name it, so many of them, they are wonderful, but they are not designed for large scalable code bases. When you use them naively, they do a lot of repeated work and small changes trigger the full rebuilds. And so your build times increase quite dramatically as your code base grows. And so you need to speed things up and there are basically two main ways to speed things up. Do less work or do more work at the same time. And to do less work means the, the way to achieve that is to break things down into many small parts um, so that you have more control over, uh, more fine-grained control over what actually needs to, what work actually needs to be done. And you want caching so that if work has been done before, you don't do it a second time. And for doing more work uh, at once, you need uh, concurrency. You need a system that is able to reason about when two pieces of work can be run at the same time. And ideally, you want remote execution so that your concurrency is not just the cores on your laptop, but an entire cluster of machines, let's say. So to work effectively, you need a build system designed for monorepos that sits on top of that existing standard Python tooling, which is great, but orchestrates them for you and runs them through a uniform interface. And that is what Pants is designed to do. Uh, Pants, a big part of its design was for it to be ergonomic, namely easy to use and um, adapted to what users expect. There are other tools, but I'm gonna focus on the one I know best here. And well, let's just dive in a little bit into how Pants works. So there are three important aspects of Pants um, that make it different from other tools you might be familiar with, like uh, classic ones such as Make. And those three are that it has a goal-based command line interface, that it relies on build graph metadata, and that it creates an extensible workflow with no side effects. So let's talk a little bit about the goal-based uh, command line interface. You don't say to Pants, uh, run MyPy or run PyTest. Instead, you specify, I want to achieve this goal and a goal might be test or package or lint, and Pants itself translates that into the necessary execution of underlying tools. 
And this is important because of invalidation and caching. We need a layer between what the user wants to achieve and the actually running processes because as we've seen, we may not need to run processes and we want to avoid that when we can. So the interface to pants is a level of abstraction above the raw tool running. Now, Pants also understands the build graph, which is the relationship between the units of code. Now, unlike other tools, Pants is smart enough to mostly infer these by looking at your import statements, but occasionally you have to provide a little extra metadata. And it can use um, these code dependencies as well as its analysis of the dependencies between units of work to create a rule graph. And the rule graph is a thing that maps outputs to inputs explicitly instead of relying on file system side effects. And of course, you can plug in custom rules for extensibility. And so that's how you end up with this workflow. The workflow recursively maps the initial inputs, files on disk, to the final outputs, which is what the user requested. And the important thing is that this workflow is side effect free. And the explicitly model workflow is what enables those four properties that I mentioned earlier, which provide speed, but they also provide stability. And so this structure of how these tools work and the fact that instead of relying on files being magically at certain locations on the file system, the fact that the tools explicitly model an input output based uh, workflow is what allows your build to be fast. So to sum up, monorepos are an effective code base architecture for Python and for other languages. They do require appropriate tooling for performance and reliability. Uh, but fortunately, this tooling exists. And I've had the uh, pleasure of working on one such tool for, for a few years now. And I invite you to uh, come and learn more. I'm very happy to take questions. And you can find out a hell of a lot more uh, at our website. I want to thank you very much for attending.
my name is Anthony Satilli, and today we're going to be talking about a tool that I wrote called All Repos, uh, which is a tool that I wrote, and I'm going to kind of talk through the reason for writing this tool, as well as a small, you know, demo. Anyway, uh, let's jump into it. All right, so in order to frame why I wrote All Repos, I've actually written it three times now. <laughs> um... The first time I wrote it was when I was at Yelp, and uh, it was during a period where Yelp was transitioning from a monolith to micro-repos. I guess I should probably talk about what all that means first. So first we're going to talk about what monoliths are. Um, the idea behind a monolith is that, you know, when a company starts out, you never really realize how big it's going to be. And so often many companies start by just having one large repo where they throw everything into there. Um, and Yelp was, you know, pretty similar to this. There was... Uh, big repository called Yelp Main, which had both, you know, the desktop site, the biz owner's site, the mobile API, basically everything was thrown into one repository. And this was really convenient when, you know, Yelp started out. Like, <laughs> this is convenient for a lot of companies. It's really easy to, you know, take one repository and make that one work well. Um, when you start introducing lots of other repositories or, or multiple repositories, you suddenly get into more like deployment issues and all sorts of other stuff. And I'll actually, I'll actually get into more of that later. Uh, but as a company grows, a monolith doesn't necessarily, you know, solve all the problems that you would want to solve for uh, a company in particular. It can be really hard to figure out who owns some things. You get a lot of, you know, ambiguous owners like, oh, who do I poke for this particular file? Well, you don't really know unless you happen to know the entire code base and happen to know everyone that works there. Um, now, there are other systems around this, like you can probably mark files or build another system on top of this, but on its own, monoliths kind of make this difficult. Um, it's also slow to iterate and develop as this you know, single repository grows and grows and grows. Uh, its build gets slower and slower, its deployment gets slower and slower, because you tend to have one big artifact that you're deploying somewhere, um, which has, has its other problems as well, like performance and, and you know, uh, other things there. Um, but yeah, and <laughs> last, lastly, and there are many other problems with monoliths. These are just the three that I decided to throw out there. The last is, you know, as a repository grows to a particular size, your version control system may have trouble keeping up with a particularly large repository. Uh, for instance, Git, although they've been making a lot of changes recently to support larger repositories, uh, notoriously does not support big repos all that well. And usually when you end up in this situation with a monolith, you usually, you know, <laughs> the popular solution is to go to microservices. And there are kind of two different approaches to microservices that I've seen popularized. One is monorepos, which we're not going to really talk about today. Um, beyond that monorepos are basically a single repository, but there are many repository-like things inside of them. Um, so you, you have independent components all versioned in a single repository. And they have their own sets of problems, their own sets of infrastructure that you need to build to support them, uh, but we're not going to talk about them today. Uh, the solution that I'm much more familiar with is micro-repositories, uh, which micro repositories for microservices. The, the idea behind micro repositories is you have you know, many services and each of your services has its own repository and it is its own independent deployable piece. And uh, you know, this, this has some benefits, like it's much easier to deploy them because uh, you can deploy them independently and like ownership is unambiguous because you know, your team owns this entire repository. Um, and the version control system tends to scale better because you're dealing with a, a very, very small repository. However, uh, they're not, you know, <laughs> they're not without their downfalls. So here are some of the, you know, problems that micro repos have in that, you know, it can often be difficult to find code. Say you're one service that calls another service. Uh, you want to know, oh, well, where is this endpoint to find? First, you have to figure out like what repository it's in, which can be difficult to find sometimes. Uh, and then you have to find like what file it's in and, you know, traversing code boundaries can be quite difficult. Um, with many, many repositories and many independent owners, uh, it can often be difficult to make sure that all of all the stuff looks about the same. So there's a lot of drift that's easy to have in small repositories, especially because like as you bootstrap new ones over time, 
and you have like some base template, that base template is going to change. And so often it's difficult to keep them all in that same you know, structure and design. Um, and lastly, sweeping changes are really difficult because on the tin, you have to go to each of these repositories and apply the same, same change over and over. And that can be either very tedious or something that's just never pursued because of, you know, because it's difficult to do correctly. Um, and these particular problems are the original motivation for writing all repos. Um, as Yelp switched to having micro repositories and microservices, uh, both libraries and services, so not just services, uh, we started to encounter a lot of these problems. It was often difficult to say like, oh, where does this particular piece of code live? And uh, you know, how do I fix it? How do I fix it everywhere? And this is where I originally wrote uh, the first closed source version of all repos. Now, that wasn't necessarily the only use case for, for all repos. I actually had an, my own personal use case, which you know, triggered the second version of this because I, I left Yelp at some point and you know, I maintain a bunch of different open source things. And the, you know, the second iteration of all repos was a tool to make it easier for me to maintain lots of open source repositories. Uh, because they have a lot of the same problems as micro repositories have at companies. You know, you have you have a ton of them, they all drift ever so slightly, and it can be really difficult to figure out, oh, I know I wrote this somewhere before, where do I find that piece of code? And so all repos was was also a solution for me to solve the micro repository problem, but for open source. And uh, I guess now we'll just jump in and show you a little bit of a demo of all repos to show you how to get started, some of the tools and, uh, you know, command line helpers that it provides and how to go about auto fixing something. OK, so I'm going to just start with a, a blank uh, <laughs> a blank directory here. You can see we've, we've got nothing here. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install the all repos tool. So I'm going to set up a virtual environment and activate it. And we're going to do pip install all repos. And this should bring in the all repos command line. Uh, you'll see that it has a single dependency on identify. Uh, but for the most part, it's pretty self-contained. It should work on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, the testing outside of Linux is significantly less, but uh, it should work on all the platforms. People have confirmed that it has worked there before. Um, now, the first command that you're going to run in all repos, I guess I should open up the readme and kind of show you <laughs> where it lives. It's on my GitHub, so you can search all repos GitHub and get to asatili slash all repos. And it has a bunch of command line tools and a bunch of configuration. The readme is pretty long, so I'm going to go over most of the basics of it, and you can read the rest of it uh, at your own pace. So the first thing, the, the first command that you're probably going to run in all repos is all repos clone. This is going to take all of the repositories that it has access to and clone them to disk. Now, of course, when we run this for the first time, all repos clone, I think it's stack traces. Yeah, it's still stack traces. Um, <laughs> I probably need to make a little bit better error messages here. Um, but the first thing that we get is that there isn't an all repos.json. And most of all repos is driven by this particular configuration file. This specifies, you know, what repositories you're going to clone and the, the, the clone or what is it called? I forget what it's called, but we'll, um, we'll look at a, an example of configuration and, uh, start by cloning that. So let's copy. Um, I'm actually going to copy both of these here. Uh, there is, uh, oops. Oh no, I splatted over the, the wrong one. Shoot. Um, well, we'll do this live. Uh, let's see, all repos. Okay, not JSON. This is the one where I um, <laughs> I blanked out the credentials so that you can't really see um, what it's going to do. <laughs> I blanked it out so that you can't just steal my crits. Um, but there is a few configuration options that happen here. Uh, the first and the most important one is the source. This is how uh, all repos is going to clone repositories. There's a bunch of different sources and you can write your own if you had you know, a special one-off source. Uh, I'm using the GitHub source here, which is going to clone every repository that I have access to. For that, you specify an API key. This is what you'll use to you know, scrape the repositories from GitHub. Um, the username actually is technically unused, but uh, can be used for some stuff if you need it. 
And I say collaborator true, this you know will include other forks. I actually don't need collaborator true for this. So I'm gonna leave that out. That's if you want repositories that you have contributor access to, but don't explicitly own. Um, and you can filter down the repositories. So I'm saying include everything in Acetilly, uh, but we're going to filter out ancient Pythons, particularly because this one is large and I rarely care about the contents of it. So we're gonna filter it out. Uh, we tell it where to output these repositories. So we're going to put it in a little repos directory. Um, and finally, there's a push uh, module here. This specifies how uh, repositories are going to get pushed if we do a distributed refactor, which we'll get to later. So that's the all repos config. Um, I hope that this... <laughs> I hope that this config has the credentials. <laughs> if not, I'll have to do some surgery. Um, so now we should be able to do all repos clone. And what this is going to do is it's going to reach out to the GitHub API. It's going to find all of the repositories that I have access to, and then it's going to clone them all on disk. Uh, now I have quite a few repositories, but this should still complete pretty quickly. It clones them in parallel, so it's a little bit faster. Um, but it's going to basically clone everything that it has access to. There was an error that happened there. That's because I have some empty repositories. Uh, empty repositories currently aren't clonable, but I don't think you would want to do sweeping changes on empty repos anyway. Okay, cool. So now we have cloned all of our repositories. Um, and if you want to you know, update all your repositories, you'll rerun all repos clone. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, the next command that I'm going to show you is all repos list repos. Uh, this kind of shows you all of the repositories that you just cloned down. Um, so you can see there's there's quite a few here. Um, and the, the way the commands are designed is they're designed to be composable. So you can run them, you know, and pipe their output into other stuff and use them in combination with each other. Now, the, the tools that I find much more powerful than just, you know, cloning and, okay, here you have them all on disk. Uh, all repos provides a bunch of distributed searching tools. Uh, the first of which is all repos find files, all repos find files. And so what this will let you do is it will let you search for files by file name. So let's say we wanted to find all of the uh, repositories which have talks configured in them. Um, so we can do all repos find files and you'll see that it can you know, print out all of the repositories that we have here. Uh, we can also specify some command line options to you know, just show the repository name or just show the path. So if we just do repos, you'll see it'll just have the path here. Um, if we did uh, output path, I think it is, yeah, then it'll use a slash instead of a colon here. That way, if you needed to, you know, pipe this into another tool, uh, you can very quickly do this. So like say I did, you know, add dash five and open those in my editor, for instance. This will let me view those files, you know, pretty quickly. You can see that even with all repos, there's still some amount of drift here. Um, actually, can get rid of this in this file. Maybe we'll do that as a distributed refactor later. Okay, so that's all repos find files. There's also all repos grep. This is the one that I like the most. Uh, let's say we wanted to find my modules which use tokenize RT, for instance, in Python files. Uh, so what this is going to do is it's going to run git grep against um, against all your repositories. And again, like there's lots of output here because there's lots of imports. And so again, you can filter this down to just repos um, or, you know, as do dash L to just get file names and output paths to put slashes there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can see all of all of the places that this particular thing is defined. in. so it's really easy to discover code across different boundaries here. But I think the thing where all repos shines the most is its distributed refactoring tooling. Uh, all repos provides a few distributed refactors out of the box. The most useful one is all repos sed, which allows you to basically run a sed expression against all the files. So let's say, let's actually take that example from before. All repos grep um, show missing in talks.ini. First, we want to filter down to the repositories that have this, and it is these three. And I actually have this defaulted in all of my repositories based on a coverage plugin that I wrote. Um, so let's do dash dash repos here. So we just get the repositories here, and we're going to do all repos said. Um, we're going to do dry run first because we don't want to have the side effects. We're going to replace show missing with nothing globally in talks.ini files. Uh, 
and we're going to select our repos based on this search that we did up here. And this is again like being able to um, you know combine these various commands together and make them work better. So this is you know <laughs> splatting all of the repository names into the repos argument. So this should run. There we go. And so now it's going to clone and apply that distributed change automatically. And if I wouldn't have done dry run, uh, which actually, you know, I want to make this change anyway. So now that I verified that it's good, I can remove dry run and it will actually go and create pull requests on GitHub for me. So you can see here um, it pushed and it'll actually end up if we go to GitHub uh, and we look at pull requests you'll see that it has, <laughs> the default commit message is not great. <laughs> it's very literal in what it's doing. Um, I probably should have done commit message so that it didn't do this particular one. But you can see that it has gone out here and it has you know, created a pull request that's removed that particular you know, argument from each of these. And these will all look basically the same because they're all the, the same change being applied over and over. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the very basic of refactoring. You can also write your own refactors of these. Uh, there are a bunch of examples in the all repos repository itself. So you can click through some of these. Some of these are based around pre-commit, like auto updating your configuration or migrating your, your hook, hook configuration or other stuff like that. Um, but all repos gives you some library functions that makes it easy to write your own auto fixer. Um, basically, it's two parts or three parts. One is your command line parsing if you need custom command line stuff. Uh, an apply fix function, which runs inside of the repository, can change whatever you want. And a find repos, which will give you the default set of repositories if you don't want to you know, do dash dash repos like I did here. So it allows you to filter the defaults down. Um, yeah, I've also used uh, all repos send and provided a few examples on the all repos incantation incantations repository, uh, which goes over some examples of where you might use all repos said directly. Um, these are kind of the, the simpler ones. So you can see like back when I used Travis CI, which I guess this hasn't been updated in a while. <laughs> you can see some of the, you know, diffs and commands that I ran and maybe take inspiration from some of those. Um, here's like a slightly more interesting one where it replaced, well, I guess it's not slightly more interesting. <laughs> it's just a set expression. <laughs> Um, and there's a bunch of other tools that all repos provides just a few others to mention quickly all repos complete gives you tab completion for clone so if you want to you know get clone acetilly slash something you can do you know get clone g tab 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 acetilly tab 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 and, and get your your list of repositories there uh, there is also all repos manual which allows you to do a distributed refactoring but you manually drop into each repository um, i think that's all of them Said. Yeah, and then there's a bunch of other ones out of the box. Also, you can configure uh, your source and push modules in a bunch of different ways. There's a few out of the box. So there's the, the GitHub one. There's this JSON one. It's kind of a dummy one, mostly used for testing. Uh, you can clone everything that forks a repository. I used this to find a microcontroller that was doing a particular set of things. Um, you can clone a specific GitHub org. I actually use this for my startup, pre-commit CI. Um, so I have configured pre-commit CI to just clone, uh, just clone the pre-commit CI repository. So I have a, a way to make sure things are up to date there. So let's say um, this is one that I know I've been putting off. <laughs> I need to upgrade cryptography to be all at the latest version. You can see I have a little bit of version drift here, but I can easily write an all repos auto fixer to make sure, make this upgrade across everything. Um, but yeah, that's all repos. <laughs> that's the things that it solves for me, particularly maintaining all of these repositories. Um, but it also might, you know, make maintaining micro repos at your company easier as well. Um, but anyway, thank you all for watching. Um, if you have additional questions, reach out to me on the various platforms. 
everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Peninsula 29. I hope you enjoyed the talks. I hope you enjoyed talking to everybody on the Discord. Um, like I said, we hope to see you soon uh, in person if possible. And if not, we'll have another virtual meetup. Um, so please remember, uh, we are always looking for more speakers. If you have any uh, idea for a talk, or if you just want to talk and want to bounce ideas off of us, you can reach out to us um, either on the Discord uh, or you can reach out to, out to us on email. Uh, we have all the details of peninsula.org and there should be plenty of links below the video to help you reach out to us. Um, so uh, please let us know if you want to speak and I'll see you next time. Bye.